like to focus on issues that may be relevant to women. These are my disclosures. So we know that women share equal burden of HIV infection, but the participation of women in HIV care trials is very low, and there's almost no data in transgender women. And these may be because of various things. A lot of the care trials involve experimental agents, that so the inclusion exclusion criteria are very strict and make it harder for women to participate. Women have many responsibilities that make it hard to come into clinical trials that generally have very, very frequent follow-up. And um, women are not mobilized perhaps in community in the same way that M MSM community is. And so all these reasons make it harder for women to be in trials, but I think it's a real missed opportunity for HIV cure research because there are real sex differences in HIV pathogenesis, and women may actually respond more favorably to many of the cure interventions that we are studying. So for an example, this is looking at elite controllers. These are people who can control viral load to undetectable levels without taking antiretroviral therapy. And these are data from nearly 30,000 people in Miami and LA looking at the prevalence of elite controllers. So there were 53 people, this, this is exceedingly rare, 26 women out of about 4,500. 24 men and three transgender women. And in fact, the group that had the highest prevalence of elite controller was black women, and the lowest frequency was in white men. And this, is, this phenomenon is also seen in the pediatric population. There was a recent study looking at pediatric elite controllers from South Africa, Europe, and Thailand, and almost all were girls. Oh. This is strange, it's completely <laughs> flipped because the anat anatomic difference is supposed to be that picture. So <laughs> I'm puzzled. Anyway, you, you can figure it out. And I don't know why the microbiome picture is gone, so. Should I go back? Huh, going back? Well, anyway, it doesn't matter. So, so there are sex differences that, that are relevant to HIV cure research. Anatomical differences, we know, of course, if HIV enters the vaginal mucosa, it could be different to rectal mucosa in terms of viral burden, as well as immune activation. I'm a little bit kind of discombobulated here, but, um, and the, the genetic differences, you know, in women, there is an X inactivation to compensate for the additional X chromosome that women has have. And um, we know that X inactivation is imperfect. There are about 20% of genes that escape that. And actually, many of the regulatory genes, some of them are actually on the X chromosome that I'll talk about, like TLR7, toll-like receptor 7, toll-like receptor 9, FOXP3, that's a marker of regulatory T cells, those are on the X chromosomes. Latency maintenance, we know that estrogen has an effect on latency. We know that immune cell phenotypes are different in women. Women have more plasma cytoid dendritic cells, more CD4. Microbiome is very different. Vaginal, vaginal dysbiosis could have an effect on target cell activation, viral, uh, viral replication, and also immune activation. So sex differences in HIV pathogenesis, what we know, women have active innate immunity. They tend to have better antiviral immunity, and this is shown when you look at women in primary infection, generally they have lower HIV viral load. Women have higher CD4 T cells, and for many vaccines such as flu, women respond better. But this overactive immunity can also be a result in chronic immune activation. Women have propensity for higher autoimmunity. And at the same viral load, women tend to progress faster than men. Now, how these factors affect the reservoir formation response to intervention to remission is something we're beginning to understand now, and a lot more work needs to be done. 
So I'd like to touch on a few topics. The first is viral burden and reservoir and strategies towards a cure. I'd like to bring up some examples of things that I think might have uh, women might have different responses to men for latency modifying agents, immune modul modulating agents, and then end with gaps in future research. So our group, the MHRP, has uh, done two acute HIV infection studies. The RV217 on the left is now coming to an end, but for many years it screened for acute infection twice weekly by finger stick of nucleic acid testing. And women, uh, the East African participants, most of them are women. The Thai participants are mostly MSM. On the right is the cohort that I've been involved in that we screen samples from participants who come in to HIV testing center and we give immediate ART. In that cohort, most of the acutely infected participants are MSM. Actually, out of the about 300,000 samples we've screened in the past 10 years, almost 100,000 samples are actually from women. And women are diagnosed in chronic infection and we see very few women in acute infection because they generally come quite late. So here are data from the RV217 study. The left is from East Africa, the right from Thailand. The East African uh, participants, mostly women, and you can see that the, the two curves are very similar, but one real big difference is that the viral set point in the East African women is about a log lower than in Thai MSM. And this is a real big difference because a log lower viral load can have an implication for HIV uh, transmission as well as disease progression. So what happens after treatment? These are data from our study in Thailand, and we had very few women, and we try to match them with males by age, by acute infection stage and duration, and ART regimen. So once ART is started, uh, there's no difference in terms of viral load suppression, but you can see the CD4 to 8 ratio, which is a marker for immune dysfunction and having higher ratio is generally better, the women have higher CD4 to 8 ratio from the very beginning at acute infection, and that is maintained throughout uh, the treatment period. So the question is that if we can give very early treatment, and these people start treatment within a day or two as after being diagnosed with acute infection, does it have an effect in terms of delayed time to viral load rebound because they have generally very low reservoir so these are viral load graphs from our three treatment interruption studies that have ended. We have 40 participants so far, and you can see time to viral load rebound is actually quite fast, even though the people were treated so early, about 26 days. There were trials that had uh, VRCO1 broadly neutralizing antibody, and some were on varinostat, which is a latency reversing agent. The two women in our studies, both were randomized to the control arms, but you can see that they tend to rebound just slightly later. Of course, we, we can do better with more uh, female participation, and this is actually uh, an area that we are very interested in. So now I'd like to talk about what effects estrogen might have on latency. You've heard from Dr. Karitskis that latency is really the, the cells are, are, are quiet. They're not transcribing virus. And so we know that estrogen receptor from past studies is a key regulator of latency. So estrogen can affect a re estrogen receptor, and in turn, that can inhibit reactivation, so making the cells even more quiet, which is the reverse from what we are trying to do with latency-reversing agents. So there's a question also whether women would respond less well to latency reversing agents, and I think this is a question we don't have an answer with uh, to. From the past uh, latency reversing agent trials, out of 50 people, there were only two women who participated in those trials. Now, this is a study that Eileen Scully did from uh, the SCOPE cohort in, in San Francisco. In this study, they had 26 women and 26 men. They were all on ART with viral load suppression, and they compared the HIV reservoir size with HIV DNA in CD4 T cells, and you can see that there were no differences between the reservoir size 
in men and women who were matched for age, for duration of ART, and for CD4. But what was different was that women had lower HIV RNA expression, meaning that if they measure cell-associated HIV RNA, the cells from women are not transcribing or not actively producing virus as in men. And when they measure low-level viremia, they also found that women have lower HIV viral load. So this goes along with the previous slide that cells from women may be in a more quiescent state. So now the next question is, what does estrogen do in trying to block HIV induction? So here the y-axis shows the frequency of HIV RNA positive cells within a million CD4 T cells. So more HIV RNA positive cells means there's more activation or transcription of virus. So you can see on the x-axis here, no stimulation is our negative control. T cell activation is blasting the T cell, trying to get it to produce more virus. So that's like a positive control. So the third one is quite significant, I think, because just adding estrogen to the T cell activation, which is a positive control, completely stops uh, HIV transcription. And you can see the HIV RNA positive cells is very similar to the negative control. So this begs the question that could we use estrogen receptor antagonist in women to try to reverse the repression that estrogen has on HIV reactivation? And could this be used with other latency reversing agent to try to increase its uh, efficacy? And so this is again um, the, the experiments that you've seen before. And if we just look at the, the last three on the x-axis, if varinostat was added to the cells, and this is a latency reversing agent with with an intention effect of having more HIV RNA positive cells, we begin to see a little bit more RNA positive cells. If estrogen receptor was blocked, like using tamoxifen, we also see an effect that is similar to a latency reversing agent. And on the third one, if they both were used together, we see a synergistic effect. And that's quite significant because it's almost, uh, it's, it's closer to the positive control. So Dan had mentioned this study, the MOXIE trial that Eileen Scully is leading. And so here is, is trying to test that question. If we use estrogen receptor blocking agent like tamoxifen with a latency reversing agent, can you actually see an effect on reversing agency and, and perhaps uh, reducing the reservoir? You can see here that they enrolled postmenopausal women for safety. Um, whether it will work in postmenopausal women who have lower estrogen remains to be seen, but the, the women were randomized to receiving tamoxifen versus no tamoxifen, and then both arms got the varinostat two doses at the end. So I think that the trial now has completed, and so we, we very much look forward to seeing the results. Now another uh, group of compounds I'd like to talk about, which I think are very relevant to to cure in women is the toll-like receptor 7 or 9 agonist that the TLR7 and 9 are on the X chromosomes and also the interferon therapy. We know that cells from women, if you actually stimulate it with TLR7 agonists, the plasma cytoid dendritic cells from women produce more interferon. And so if we think about estrogen effect and X chromosome dosage, even though we know that there's X inactivation in, in females, this is uh, imperfect. And so different female also have different dosage of X chromosome. And this is of course very different to men. And so if we are able to stimulate the TLR7 or 9 receptors with TLR7 or 9 agonists, and increase the production of interferon alpha. This could potentially have an effect in reversing latency in CD4 T cells. At the same time, these are adjuvants, so it could also augment the cellular immune responses to the virus. And so um, Dr. Kuritskas didn't talk about the TLR7 
agonist trial, but I'd like to mention a little bit that it has been used in monkey studies and really show promise, especially when it's used with broadly neutralizing antibody or vaccines. So in human studies, there are ongoing studies using TLR7 agonist dose finding as well as um, multiple dosages. Another compound is TLR9 agonist, which TLR9 is also on the X chromosome. And the, the intention of this is that if we give TLR9 agonist, we can induce the plasma cytoid dendritic cells to produce more interferon alpha. And so in this graph, you can see that by week 24, which is after the dosing of TLR9 agonist, there's fourfold increase in interferon alpha, and they also show activation of CD4, CD8 T cells, as well as NK activation. In some people, they even see more, uh, they even see detectable levels of plasma viral load in these people who've been viral load suppressed for about eight years. And you can see that uh, in this small study, there were two women out of 15 participants. So there is a planned study using TLR9 agonist along with broadly neutralizing antibody in virally suppressed adults. Now interferon is another one because we know that cells from women produce more interferon and this could be quite relevant to HIV cure research. The higher interferon likely was uh, uh, resulted in the effect that we see the women clear hepatitis C at a higher rate. And so this could have both effects. I think women could potentially respond better to interferon therapy, or women could have more toxicity because they already have more interferon than men. So in this study done uh, several years ago, people were given PEG interferon alpha 2A uh, during with ART and then after ART was interrupted. And the endpoint was viral load control below 400 copies after ART was removed. So you can see here in the graph compared to historic controls, the PEG interferon arm did much better. In fact, 45% were able to control the virus after 12 weeks of coming off ART, which is really way more than in general. If we stop ART in anyone, we would see viral load rebound much faster. And in that study, four of the 20 participants were women. Now, there are several studies that are going on in interferon. Um, one study, the BEAT HIV, is uh, being presented here. And this is using PEG interferon alpha 2B that is, um, has similar antiviral activity, but likely more tolerable, and also could have better tissue penetration. And the B2 vaccine, uh, B2 study will enroll 21 participants, and that will be given with two broadly neutralizing antibodies. So the beat HIV, there were six women in the 54 participants. So among these studies that have small number of women in a small study, um, none of them have looked at the response in women separately, and I think that's really an opportunity to understand if women do respond uh, differently to men. So if we think about female relevant strategies overall in HIV remission research, on the top you can see that we could look at estrogen receptor blocking with a latency reversing agent. Another strategy that could be potentially studied in women is block and lock. This is a, a, a diff, uh, totally opposite from, from the strategy that you've heard of shock and kill. Basically, it's trying to keep the cells in deep latency so it will never reactivate. So this is still very early in HIV cure research. But if you think about it, cells from women are generally in a more quiescent state. So perhaps the block and lock might work better in women, and I think this should be studied. In terms of stimulating the TLR7 or 9 receptor, there are TLR7 and 9 agonists, and so this is one thing that I think we should try to have more women participation in research studies. Therapeutic vaccines and broadly neutralizing antibodies may have a differential effect in women because women generally have a more active uh, immunity and higher CD4 T cells. The checkpoint blockers are being used in HIV cure research and a recent study looking at uh, multiple cancer trials have suggested that women are less responsive to checkpoint blockers. And so I think this is something we should follow. 
Anti-inflammatory agents might be used in women that have generally higher immune activation. And then if CCR5 upregulation on CD4 is truly a big issue in women, then there are many gene editing therapies that are being studied now to reduce the CCR5 expression. So there are many knowledge gaps that we should work on. I think that there's not a lot of information yet on HIV reservoir distribution in women. You know, the impact of adolescence, postmenopausal, people who are pregnant, uh, breastfeeding, people who are taking hormone or, or estrogen blocking agents. And so future research, I think that there are some animal models that are set up to study sex differences and perhaps these could be used to test combinations that may be relevant to women. I think cohorts that are doing HIV reservoir assessment cure research should be collecting more information and we have al already changed in our cohort to collect uh, information on menstrual cycle, on hormonal use and then characterize the reservoir immune response microbiome in the different groups by timing of infection, the diverse population, and people who are already taking exogenous hormone or, or blocking, uh, blocking agents. And then in HME remission research, particularly ones that are really relevant to women like the toll-like receptor 7 or 9, I think there should be more effort to, to try to have more women in those trials. And even the existing trials, you know, we should be analyzing and report data on women separately. And also designing trials that have female rel relevant strategies. So. Um, I'd like to conclude that there are sex differences that I think could be very relevant to HIV cure research. We see tendency for HIV latency in women. We have the opportunity to use estrogen receptor blockade to reverse latency in women. And certain response to interventions like TLR7 and 9 block and lock strategy, and then having more women participate and transgender women participate in HIV cure research. So I'd like to acknowledge study participants. All these CURE studies require so much effort and, and um, contribution by the participants. These are sponsored from our trials and Eileen Scully, who I talked to, to get the idea of, of presenting here. And I think she should be invited next time, if possible. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Internet. And we are grateful that you accepted the invitation this year, and Ali and I have been corresponding about next year already. Um, any questions, any comments in regards of the presentation? Yes, there is one here, one there, one there. So if we can start here. And two questions there. Brilliant talk to internet, thank you. Um, and I know I asked you this question before about a year ago. Is there any research, do you think, from your opinion needed in about breast milk and the latency? Because there's still, you heard the question before and after the talk. And um, yeah, because with the estrogen, it might be blocked. And that's what we think and what we believe when we allow women to breastfeed. But what is your opinion? Is there any, um, any op opportunity to measure this, if this can be activated? Or, or do you think there's, we know enough to, to go for it? <laughs> Yeah, um, no, th those are very Sorry. good questions, and I, I, I don't have the answer for them. I, I definitely, there's not enough information about that. And there are very sensitive measures now of um, the HIV reservoir and uh, different measures to, to characterize whether cells are, um, how difficult or easy they are to be reactivated. Uh, sequencing uh, methods to see whether they are replication competent because as, as Dan mentioned many most of the provirus are defective but there are ways we can tell whether these are intact viruses so I think that the, the key is really to collect samples and to to try to study the cells uh, from from breast milk to try to characterize that more and as, as breastfeeding is now being used more even in resource-rich settings, I think that, that um, the ability to transmit through breast milk under viral suppression definitely needs to be looked at. Thank you. Question number two. 
Hi, um, I'm curious about the estrogen effects. Are they all directly through the estrogen receptor or are any of them like non-specific? And which estrogen receptor? Um, I think that th th this is very early research. So, um, so far it's the characterization was through estrogen receptor one, but there, there must be other mechanisms as well, because that alone I don't think it would explain everything. And um, yeah, I, I, I can't say beyond that. Number three, please. And, uh, Hi, uh, Karen Beckerman from the Bronx. Uh, thank you very much for your great presentation. I just think there's a... Um, unexplored as of yet new pool of women that can really uh, be uh, recruited into these studies and that is actually pregnant women. Mm. Uh, PrEP is finally uh, being accepted by some of these women and many of us in high seroprevalence uh, communities are, are pushing PrEP very hard as well as uh, as part of routine prenatal screening trying to identify exposed women. and. Uh, I think the women who are exposed and acutely infected are going to start surfacing very rapidly. Mm -hmm. We already have one uh, in the Bronx, and uh, we have a, cop a captive population, sort of, with women in prenatal care. They will come to, our vi to their visits, our visits, and they will um, participate. They're um, highly motivated to stay healthy for the duration of their pregnancy, and if we can just use that as a hook into uh, not only prevention research, but also cure research, um, I think it's very promising. The unfortunate thing is, as far as I can see, is that these women do not live in communities with proximity to cure research. So I don't know how through collaboration we can start doing this um, between high seroprevalent areas uh, in the United States and the actual places where the research is being done. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. That's a very good point, that the entry of women into cure research could be during pregnancy. And cure research is many things. You know, if we even have a cohort that we try to characterize the reservoir in the presence of pregnancy, that's already cure research. And, and there's really not enough information even with that alone. So in terms of experimental agents, that um, could have, I mean, many agents are actually cancer drugs. And yeah. so we would want to use those after the women are no longer pregnant and no longer breastfeeding. But, you know, they could enter the, 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 the follow-up before that period. And I think that HIV care research could really advance if we have the ability to do home viral load testing. Because as you know, there are many research trials that have treatment interruption. And so having to come to the clinic twice a week or once a week or every two weeks is, is, is such a huge burden for participants. And so if we have home viral load testing, then I think there could be easier, it could be easier for women to participate in those research. Thank you. There is one question, question one here or not? There was one. Uh, Gina, Still, please. I think Gina. I, I can't yeah. see. Um, Jintan, both thanks to both you and Dan, um, Dan for laying the foundation and you for talking about how this research can really be tweaked and looked at in terms of the differences in women. And so my question is, is there any thought about the different levels of kinds of estrogens for in women based upon age, or so the relative amounts of estradiol versus estriol um, and potentially estrone, looking at, well, you know, what, how you would approach this looking at women across the life cycle, you know, at different ages? Yeah, it's, it's very difficult, and I mean, that's why there's not much <laughs> known because it's so messy. Um, I think that, you know, we got to start somewhere and, and perhaps enroll women in different age groups, a uh, significant number, um, adolescent, perhaps uh, pre-adolescent, then through the different Tanner stages, and then people who are childbearing age, you know, maybe by groups of five years or 10 years, and really document very well the menstrual cycle and also any uh, other hormone uses. And then as, as people enter, you know, the menopausal phase as well. Um, 
And then this transgender women population, uh, that's also very difficult. And we have research in Thailand to look at transgender women as well. And, and that, you know, you don't know, sometimes it's not clear what exogenous hormone is, is being used. And then there are fillers and which can cause inflammation. So um, I, I think there won't be any perfect study, but um, if we can start somewhere, that would already be an advancement. Any more questions? Thank you, Jim, and that was wonderful.